three processes in which heat can be transferred from one point to another. The first one we're going to look at is conduction. So the three processes are, are conduction, convection, and radiation. Okay. So conduction is a process that usually takes place in solids. You can see one end of a rod here is hot. The temperature is Th. The other end is comparatively cold. The temperature is Tc. Again, Th is greater than Tc. And heat slowly moves or is conducted from the hot end to the cold end. Now, conduction is a slow process, and it usually takes place in solids. And the formula for heat conducted is given by Q is equal to KATH minus TC by D. Here, it's actually Q by T. T here is the time. So Q is the quantity of heat conducted. T is the time in seconds. A is the area. Now, when we talk about area, look at this diagram. It's the area of cross-section. See that? See the area there? And if it's uh, rectangular like that, you know that the area is going to be the width times the thickness. Isn't that how you find the area? But if it's a circular cross-section like a rod, a rod like this, how do you find the area? How do you find the area of a circle? Oh, come on. Area of a circle. No, that was right. Pi r squared. That's correct. So you got to be careful. A is the area of cross section. You got to use either pi r squared if it's circular or width times thickness if it's uh, rectangular. Now, TH and TC are the temperatures, and D is the length of the rod in this case, or D is the separation between TH and TC, okay? So this question says, calculate the rate of heat conduction. Now, when you see the word rate, that means it's per second. So the time is already mentioned. Heat conduction, so it's about conduction, through house walls that are 13 centimeter thick, that's a brick, uh, the thickness of the brick, and have an average thermal conductivity. Oh, in that formula, I forgot to mention that you saw a letter K. Mm -hmm. K is a constant called thermal conductivity. So write that. K is a constant called thermal conductivity, and it depends on the material. So it has a certain number or certain value for each material. And so here it says it has an average thermal conductivity twice that of glass wool. Assume there are no windows or doors. I mean, what a house. <laughs> That's just an assumption, you know, just an assumption to make calculations easy. The surface area of the walls is 120 meters squared. The inside surface is at 18, while outside is at 5 degrees Celsius. Okay, tell me, is it summer or winter? Is it summer or winter? winter? Winter, because the outside is at 5 and the inside is at 18. You notice that? So that means we're using room heaters to keep the temperature inside higher. So which direction is heat being conducted? Obviously, from the inside to the outside. Heat is escaping. So you have TH, which is 18. TC is 5. And the question is, how many one kilowatt room heaters would be needed to balance the heat transfer due to conduction? So you just find out the heat conducted in one second. So you find out Q in one second. So here is how we do it. Here is the formula. Q by T is Ka T2 minus T1 by D. Now, this number, K, will be given. Now, why do I have two times? This is the thermal conductivity of glass wool. 
Doesn't the problem say it's twice that of glass wool? So you have to be careful. This is the conductivity of glass wool that will be, that will be given. So two times that number is K. And then the area is given, uh, 120. And temperature difference is, well, I use T2 minus T1, the same thing as TH minus T. And why is the distance 0.13? Because we need it in meters, 13 centimeter. So 13 divided by 100 is 0.13. When you do the calculations, let's see what you get. You said 1008. Yeah, I considered significant figures, so I put it as 1.01 times 10 to the 3 which is 1,010. So you said 1,008. 1,020 is a square? No, that's just the unit, meter square, see? Area is 120 meter squared. I just put the units along with the numbers. You squared it? OK. So now, isn't that about one kilo what? Kilo means 1,000. Come on. So how many do you need? How many heaters do you need? Hey, just one, that's it, just one. So if you had got the answer as uh, two kilowatts, you would have said you needed two room meters of one kilowatt each, okay? So that's the problem. Is that understandable? Simple, so it's simple application of conduction. So at what net rate? So what is the quantity of heat radiated per second? Does heat radiate from a 275 meter squared black roof? So that is the surface area given directly on a night when the roof's temperature is 30 degrees Celsius. <gasps> what did I tell you about temperature in this form there? has to be in Kelvin. But there is another problem. The surrounding temperature is also given, isn't it? And in the formula that I gave you, I only gave you the object's temperature. So what you got to do in that formula is, you got to put minus the surrounding temperature raised to 4. I'm going to show you that right now. The formula slightly changes like this. Like if the surrounding temperature is not given, just ignore it. But if it's given, then you see the difference that happened there? Did you? So T2 is the temperature of the object. T1 is the temperature of the surrounding. So that formula changes. And then all you got to do is plug in the numbers carefully. Missivity is 0.9. Sigma is a constant, which is Stefan's constant. I'm just writing the units down there. Then the area in meter squared. And then you have the temperature in Kelvin. So 30 degrees Celsius becomes 303. And uh, 15 becomes 288. Uh, you really need to be careful when you calculate this part. In your calculator, do this first. And I tell my students to do this and put that somewhere, write it somewhere. It's going to be big numbers. Then after you get that, multiply the other numbers, and you should get the answer. I'm going to wait for the answer. So, yes, 21.7. And oh, what did it stop there? Okay. What? Huh. I was calculating. 21736 is what you said, right? 2.17 times 10 to the 4? Yes. That, that's fine. But that's so good. Usually people make a mistake because you have those two big numbers raised to 4 and the difference, or oh, all kinds of dance goes on. So if you got it, sure, you're going to get one or two questions on the exam. And, and this, I can't make it so indirect there. You know, I have to give you everything, make you calculate. So this is where you could get some points. 
Now the word, this chapter is called thermodynamics. Thermal, thermo means heat. Dynamics means moving. So using heat to move objects. You came to school using heat. Because that's what your car is. It uses heat to move. So this is where we get the idea of engines from. But uh, before all that, we need to define some things, you know, define systems and look at the loss of thermodynamics and all that. So we'll do that. So please listen to me very carefully. And this is just an example of water boiling in a kettle. The water inside the kettle is called the thermodynamic system. So when I, whenever I say a thermodynamic system, you must have some material, like liquid, gas. It could be a mixture of different materials, all right? And do you know that if that lid of the kettle uh, is loosely closed, you know that when steam is produced, it'll rattle, wouldn't it? So which already shows that heat can do work. From there, we had the idea of the steam engine. We're getting there soon. You can use steam to move something. Especially steam at high pressure can move because it'll expand, see? So that's the idea. We need to be thankful for those scientists who thought about it. Otherwise, we would have been traveling on elephants and horses or walking to school, I don't know, or bicycles maybe, because they existed. So here, is, uh, here are some definitions on which the whole chapter is based. Here is the system. Q is the quantity of heat coming in, coming into the system. And this is the work done by the system. So when heat enters a system, and I hope you're listening carefully, understanding, when heat enters a system, a part of that heat will be used to do work. Like, for example, can you imagine a cylinder with a loosely fitted piston and there is a gas inside? And if heat enters, what's going to happen to that piston? If it's free to move, wouldn't, wouldn't the gas expand? And it's pushing the piston, right? And that's work. Because what's work? When anything moves because of the application of a force, work is done. Are you with me? So when heat enters the system, you would see that piston move up and work is being done by the system. But that's not all. Wouldn't the temperature of the system go up because heat is entering? So that means the internal energy of the system is going up. So what do you mean by internal energy? What will happen to the molecular motion? As heat enters, what will happen to the molecular motion? Increases. So the kinetic energy increases, and that, and also there is potential energy. The sum of the two is called internal energy. So what you see there as delta U stands for change in internal energy. So you have the three terms. I think I explained the three terms. Let's go again. What's Q? Quantity of heat entering the system. What's that W? Come on, what's that? Work done by the system. Remember, work done by the system is taken as positive. Write that down. Work done by the system is positive. And work done on the system is negative. I'll explain that in a bit. And what is delta U? energy, correct. So I'm giving an example here. If Q is 100 joules and the work done by the system is 70 joules, then the change in internal energy is 30 joules. <laughs> Silly. Isn't it? Come on. Because 30 is 100 minus 70, in case you didn't know. So that's called the first law of thermodynamics. That equation, this equation is the first law of thermodynamics.
getting in. And now there are two more things that I have to tell you. Heat can enter a system or heat can leave a system. So look at this, if heat enters a system, heat is coming in, it's positive. If heat is going out, it's negative, see? Same way, work can be done by a system, that's when the gas expands. Or can't you also compress the gas? Like we can manually push the piston down, can't we? Now what are we doing? We are doing work on the system, you see the difference? So we, nobody likes that, so we call it negative. If we have, nobody likes doing work, that's the truth. So if we are asked to do work, we say oh, that's negative. And we say be positive, which means do work for me. Mama, bring that here. Positive. <laughs> Just keep that in mind. Work done by a system is positive. Work done on a system is negative. Second, heat enters the system, positive. Heat leaves, it's like us getting money. You get money, positive. Heat enters. You got to spend money for something you don't like, negative. Like pay the tuition, we don't like that. Buy dresses, yes. Okay. So here's the question, what is the change in internal energy? And it says the system does 4.5 volt times 10 to the 5 joules. So the system is doing work. So you will keep your work as positive. Now don't be confused. Your work is positive, but in the formula it's negative, that work, isn't it? So it's going to be negative of a positive work. Are you with me? So don't, don't just go, some students get confused. They will be like, didn't you say it's positive? So I'm going to change the sign in the formula. I'm not asking you to change the sign in the formula. While 3 times 10 to the 6 joules of heat transfer occurs into the system. So heat is coming in, see? So both Q and work, both are positive. Therefore, when you substitute it into the formula, this is what you're supposed to get. That's my formula. I'm not going to change that. Q is positive. There it is. Minus is going to stay as minus, right? Because negative times positive is negative. And then, why did I do that? What is that? Where is that coming from? Can somebody tell me? Because if you read the problem carefully, heat is not only entering the system, it's also leaving. See? And 8 times 10 to the 6 joules of heat goes to the environment. So heat is coming in and heat is going out. Did you notice? Mm -hmm. So that's why I had to put a negative there. Well, what I did is I took the heat coming in minus the heat going out. See, I did that first. Are you with me? Heat coming in minus the heat going out, and then I did negative the work. So together that gives negative 5.45 times 10 to the 6 joules. Problem done. I think I'm going to, I was trying to explain this to somebody. Oh no. Because I, it's just come up, I'll tell you another thing. Work done is given by the formula Pressure times change in volume. Write this down. Work done is change, pressure times change in volume. Let me write that again. Just write this. Work is pressure times change in volume. So when the piston moves up, as the gas expands, when does the piston know when to stop? Is it intelligent? No, oh, it stops when the pressures are equalized. So the pressures are constant, but wasn't there a change in volume when it expanded? So you take that constant pressure multiplied with the change in volume, right? Because this French engineer called Sadie Carnot, S-A-D-I-C-A-R-N-O-T, he's the first one to think about I'm going to make something that moves on its own. 
just imagine if somebody says that for the first time when, when there is nothing that moves, he comes up and says, I'm going to make something that moves on its own. And his friends laughed at him, scorned him. He said, no way. He said, yes. He said, here is the blueprint. You know, before you construct a house, you need a blueprint and the drawing and all that. So this is the blueprint that you see of a heat engine. What is a heat engine? Your car is a heat engine. And remember, the word car comes from Carnot. C-A-R-N-O-T was his last name, right? C-A-R. That's how it comes from, that French engineer. I'm so thankful for him. I don't know about you, but I am. So here's the blueprint. He says for a heat engine, there must be three parts. The heat engine has three parts. One is called the source, the second is the sink, and the third is the working substance. Are you listening to me? What is the source? What do you mean by the source? It's from where you get something. What do you get in this case? Heat. So you need to get heat from somewhere, right? That's the source. What do you mean by the sink? Sink is a place where you throw the waste, kind of. So after you've used the heat, to do work, whatever remains, you throw it out into the sink. So did you get the idea of a source and a sink? Source is from where you get the heat, sink is where you reject the heat. And who's gonna do all this? The working substance. And Mr. Carnett said the working substance must be an ideal gas. <laughs> Can you name an ideal gas? No, you can't, there's none. So his engine is a theoretical engine. He's not looking at the practical side. He's like, it's a perfect engine. We need an ideal gas. It should take the heat, do work, and then reject the reminder to the sink. So in this diagram, do you understand what's happening? Watch this diagram now. What is this? Oh, please help me. Heat, no, you see Q sub I N. What is that? That means heat is coming in. Heat is coming in. And then a certain part of, his, a part of it is used to do work. You see the work done? And what is that? Heat is going out. That's the simple working of a heat engine. You guys just need the simple ideas. We're not going into details. So that's what a heat engine does. Get heat. Use a part of it to do work. Whatever remains. Push it out. So, the work done. Very simply, how much work is done? For example, if 1,000 joules come in and 400 joules goes out, how much work was done? 1,000 joules came in, 400 joules was pushed out. How much work was done? I'm going to run away from this place. 600. So, how did you get that? Subtract. So what's the formula for work? Work is Q-I-N minus Q out. There. Work is Q-I-N minus Q out. Have you heard of something called efficiency? What is, generally what is efficiency? It's output by input. So what you get out divided by what you put in. What's the output here? The output here is the work. So if you divide the work by the input, which is QIN, you get the efficiency. And usually efficiency is expressed as a percentage. So that's why we multiply it with 100. So here's a good formula for you. Efficiency of a heat engine or Carnot's engine is work divided by QIN times 100. Isn't that simple? So a certain heat engine does 10 kilojoules of work. And 8.50 kilojoules of heat transfer occurs to the environment. So is that Q in or Q out? Q out. Yeah. So I can't ask any simpler question than this, see? It's so simple. Just 
put the work down, recognize what it is. Oh, hold on. Whenever you see a cyclical process, you should know that the change in internal energy is zero. Please write that somewhere. I'm going to tell you what a cyclical process is. It's where you come back to where you started. In a cycle. Haven't you heard of that? So you start, we'll be drawing diagrams and you'll get it. But for now, if it's a cyclical process or cyclical process, the change in internal energy is zero. Okay. That being said, then you know work is equal to Q and I now I used different symbols. Let me explain those symbols. QH. Why do I call it QH? Well, because your textbook called it. But what's QH? From where do you get that Q in? Where do you get that heat from? Is it from the hot or the cold? Where do you get heat from? A hot object or a cold object? That's what the H stands for. So when you see QH, it's the same as Q in. That means you're getting the heat, but from where are you getting it? You're getting it from the hot object. So the text uses both of these, unfortunately. So QH is Q in. And QC, similarly, is Q out. So we know that that's the formula for work, QH minus QC, isn't it? QN minus Q out, and then, so QH would be, when you rearrange that, work plus QC, so QH is this, 8.5 kilojoules. 18.5, I mean, 18.5 kilojoules. Is that clear enough? Looks like an essay, it's simply two numbers, but. In the second part, what was the engine's efficiency do it? So when you did the efficiency, Louis, you got it? No, efficiency is work over QH, isn't it? We already got the work, it's given, and you have QH, divide, and you get the efficiency. Now, if you want to put it as a percentage, you got to multiply it with 100. 54.1%. Oh, okay it's okay, too. Yeah. So there's another formula for efficiency. E is equal to TH minus TC by TH. Just like the other one, remember E was QH minus QC by QH. Wasn't this a formula that I gave you? Because this is work. So now you have to use this formula to find the efficiency. And uh, being college physics, you need not even know how we get that formula because that involves a lot of steps to go from one to the other. Yep, I see you shake your head. That's true. You don't need to, that's uh, the difference. One difference. Efficiency here, <laughs> and I wrote it as, I wrote it differently. Now you're going to say that's wrong. No, it's not. See, what I did is I divided TH by TH, that's one, and then minus TC by TH, that's all I did. Isn't that another way of putting it? Just divide each one. So it's the same formula, please, please. You got to find what? Aren't you asked to find? Q A T H. Did you read the question? Yes. yes. Because the question says, "What's the hot reservoir temperature?" So you're looking for T H. The efficiency is given, and Q C is given. Oh, another thing. Temperatures have to be in. Again, temperatures have to be in Kelvin. Kelvin will always work. So if you're ever in doubt, always change into Kelvin. So what I did is I tried to make TH the subject, and then I plugged in the numbers. 
but you can do it differently. You usually students plug in numbers and then move it around, do it either way. But do you get this answer? 517.2 Kelvin. You can leave it in Kelvin. You need not change it into Celsius. And also notice that the efficiency was given as 42%, but I used what? What did I use? 0.42, why? Because if you're using efficiency, you'll have to, in the formula, you have to multiply with 100, remember? So I'm not multiplying with 100. I want to keep the formula simple, so please don't put 42 there. That'll be a tragedy. So that's how you do that first part. Now think about the second part. So the B part says, what must the hot reservoir temperature be? That means TH. You're looking for TH. For a real heat engine. Oh, so this is not a real heat engine? No, I told you it's an ideal engine. Didn't I? So for a real heat engine that only achieves 0.7 of the maximum efficiency, but still has an efficiency of 42%. I know that's a little confusing. And the cold one is at what? 27 degree Celsius? All right, so I don't know. Did anybody do it? This is how you do it. Watch. All right, let it come up slowly. Efficiency is given as 0.42, but it's 0.7% of that. So, point, I mean 0.7 of that. Oh, what am I doing? I wrote it twice. Oh, goodness. I wrote it twice. Now. I'm cleaning it up now. So 0.42 times 0.7 gives you 0.294. Did anybody do that? Did you understand? Because the question says it's only having an efficiency 0.7 of 0.42. So you've got to multiply with that. You get 0.294. Then use the formula. TH is TC by this. TC is 300 Kelvin. Why 300? Isn't it 27 degrees Celsius? So 300 divided by 1 minus the efficiency. I changed the numbers. All right, so 1 minus 0 0.294. Which gives me 424.9 Kelvin. Did you get that answer before? No, I have to buy the 0.42. Oh, instead of multiplying, OK. Now, does your answer imply practical limits to the efficiency of car gasoline engines? Yes, since automobile engines may get overheated their efficiency is going to be actually less than. I mean, isn't heat being wasted in a, in a car engine? Come on now. Isn't the whole thing getting hot? Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> That's a waste of heat. Another thing, in the car, what's the sink? What's, what's the place you throw away the heat to? The atmosphere. Where do you get the heat from? You get it from inside the engine as the gasoline burns. So did you notice in Carnot's engine, he did not even need a fuel because it's an ideal engine. He just says, you got to get the heat from somewhere, OK? So but in, in real life, you got to produce the heat. That's why we need the fuel, which is gasoline. Wait, hold on. Does anybody know what's the actual working substance in the car? What's the substance that's actually taking all the heat, expanding, doing work? Gasoline. No, that's the fuel. That's the fuel, I just told you. That's what supplies the heat. It's air. Now, that's why in old engines, we had what's called a carburetor. Have you heard of the carburetor where 
the gasoline vapor would be mixed with air and sucked into the cylinder. And then as the gasoline burns, I'm just trying to give you a little idea. The gasoline burns, the air absorbs the heat and expands. So air is the working substance. Wait, haven't you heard of an air filter in your car? Don't you have to change that? That's where it's coming. You don't want all the dust to be sucked in with the air. Does that make any sense? So you purify the air, kind of, keep the dust particles, and you need to be... So if you don't change your air filter, <laughs> there's no air that's flowing into it. I mean, not enough. And so you're wasting fuel. Because the fuel will burn, we'll try to, and there's not enough air to take that heat and expand. So think about it. It's the air that gets the heat, and boom, the piston flies out. That's work, right? And so every time it goes in, it burns, gets the heat, pushes the piston out, you get work. And then the piston goes back again, and then again the cycle is repeated. You know what I'm trying to say? What's the size of the engine of your car? Does anybody know? Okay, so when you said five point, did you say 5.3? Are you talking about the actual size of the engine? No, no, that's right. What you said is right. What do you mean by 5.3 liters? When, you, when somebody says, it's the size of the cylinder. Let me draw it on this whiteboard just to, it's how big the cylinder is with the piston. This is an engine. That's all you need. With, of course, there are inlet, outlet valves and all that stuff. I'm not even going there. But this is, the maximum that the piston can come is there, and the minimum would be somewhere here, see? So what is happening is the piston goes back and forth. That's what is happening. And you change this to and fro motion into a rotation using a flywheel. Have you heard of a flywheel? Because you don't want to be in one place dancing like that. Imagine your car does that. Okay. You're getting to school. Okay. Don't know when. Okay. So you want to change that. So you have all the other mechanisms, but basically this is the engine. And you can't have one cylinder. You need at least four. Because there are four strokes in an engine. Have you heard of a four-stroke engine, somebody? No? Okay, so there are four strokes. I'll talk about that a little bit. Do you want to hear about it? It takes five minutes, and then it'll be okay. So let me just put an end to this. I told you that work is given by what? The formula, pressure times change in volume. Did you write that down somewhere? Work is, yeah, pressure times. And here what you see is heat coming in. You see the cylinder and the piston, and like I told you, the piston is going in and out. Uh, you see that there? and then heat also goes out. Here heat comes in, the piston is pushed in, it's still going in there, work is done. You see the flywheel there, do you see it? It changes the to and fro motion to circular motion. These are the formulas that I talked about and then heat is rejected. So all that is shown on a graph, we'll get there in a second. This is a zoomed in diagram of the cylinder and the piston, you see work is What's work? Pressure times, change in volume. That's what I'm trying to show there. How do we get that formula? Isn't work force times distance? And force is pressure times area. Did you know that? And so an area times D is change in volume. Look at this. That piston has an area. It moves through a certain distance. And wouldn't this change in volume be just the area times the height, which is the distance? That's how you get that formula. Got it? Okay. Here is the graph that you really have to understand. Now, this is called a pressure volume diagram. Pressure on the y-axis, volume on the x-axis. All right, let's stop and think. Starts at A. We're talking about the air inside that piston, okay? So is the, isn't there a particular pressure and it occupies a certain volume? You see that? And then, if AB is a process, do you understand that the pressure is constant throughout this process? 
Do you understand the pressure is constant throughout the process? Well, what about the pressure at A and B? Are they the same or different? Same. So such a process is called an isobaric process. More terms coming in. Isobaric process, what is that? Where the pressure remains constant. I'm letting you write it down. Now, when it goes, if it goes from B to, let me call this point C, if it goes from B to C, what's constant? Volume, volume is constant. It's called an isovolumetric process. It's not written there. Isovolumetric. V O L U M E T R I C. Isovolumetric process means volume is constant. So if I just draw it on this, that would be the process, right? And then if it goes this way, what's constant now? Pressure. <laughs> As drawn on the diagram, pressure is zero, actually. Anyway, and this is back. Now you have a cyclic process. Did you understand why it's a cyclic process? Didn't we start from A, went to B, to C, to D, back to A? Come on. So that's a cyclic process. And the total work done here is given by the area of that diagram because the area gives pressure times change in volume if you're watching carefully. Do you see? Isn't it a rectangle? And the area of a rectangle is length times width. So pressure times change in volume becomes the area of the diagram. So a very important point. To find the work done, you just need to find the area of the pressure volume diagram. Right that. You just need to find. So work is that. And I'm just showing the units of pressure and volume and showing that it becomes joule. Oh, now I drew it over. You can find the area of the left pressure. The the pressure volume diagram. The pressure volume diagram. That's a cyclic process, and I think I told you that in a cyclic process, the change in internal energy is what? Zero. Okay. So so many conceptual points of understanding there. For processes. Well, I'm drawing some molecules of a gas there. All right, here are all the four. If pressure is constant, it's called isobaric. Volume constant, it's called isovolumetric. We've already looked at them. Temperature is con If temperature is constant, it's called isothermal. If entropy, have you heard of entropy? If entropy is constant, it's called I would call it isentropic, but the textbooks call it adiabatic. So, so that's a totally different name, so you have to know. And I'm going to tell you, uh, give you ideas about entropy. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry about anything. Just keep listening. How many have heard about entropy? Two? Uh, let me define entropy. <laughs> but entropy cannot be defined. Entropy is like love. You can't define it. Now, you could say, you could give ideas like love is the feeling of being with somebody all the time, but you've not really defined love, you know. Now, these are called abstract nouns. I'm not joking. It's like pain. If somebody's never experienced pain, how do you define pain? You can't touch the person. You can't prick him with a pin and say, hey, that's pain. No, you can't. How do you define it? You can't. You know what I'm, those are called abstract nouns. Entropy is an abstract noun. You can't define it. It's not like volume where you say, look, it's a space occupied by something. You can't. So we try to get an idea of entropy like this. We say entropy is the measure of disorder of a system. Did you hear me? So if the molecules are more disordered, then you say the entropy is high. Now, when are the molecules more disordered? When its temperature is high. 
So now we get the idea that, oh, if heat enters the system, it becomes more disordered, entropy goes up. If you pull out heat from a system, like you're cooling a system, then the entropy goes down. Do you know the, the, the minimum temperature that can be reached? Absolute zero. Right. And so, at absolute zero, the entropy becomes zero. That's actually the third law of thermodynamics. You don't need it, but I'm just giving you an idea. Because at absolute zero, all molecular motion will stop, isn't it? Everything will be like at a standstill. And that's when you say entropy is zero. So is that why they, well, aside from space, uh, when they transport uh, gas under the tankers, they liquefy it? Well, so liquid. That, that's, mm. that's conserves, I guess, space. They can transport more of it, but it makes it more stable. To, uh, to transport more of it, and so to liquefy it, you'll have to keep it under a high pressure. Because as soon as the pressure reduces, it becomes a gas again. Like the propane that we use for cooking, did you know? Of course you knew that it's a liquid in the cylinder. Did you know that? It's not a gas. It's only when you open the valve and the pressure becomes the atmospheric pressure, the liquid changes into a gas. You know that? I mean, if you shake that cylinder, you can see it moving. Or, I mean, you can feel it moving, not see. <laughs> Nobody knows what I'm talking about. Have you all heard of propane? Okay. Yeah, it's a liquid inside, and it's kept on high pressure. That's another part of physics. We're not going there, but I think you got the idea. So those are the four processes, right? Here I'm giving you the difference between three processes. Watch. So a system goes from point A to B. That's an isothermal. And you take it back to A and then take it. If it's an adiabatic process, it's a different path. Do you see the path? Or as shown in this diagram, it's like isothermal, then oh. Isovolumetric is also called isochoric. That's so unfortunate. Why two words? Isovolumetric is also called isochoric. BC is in the volume constant. And then this is an adiabatic process. All right, wait one minute. Which of these two has a bigger slope? Is it the isothermal or the adiabatic? Which one has a bigger slope? You know the meaning of slope? Come on. The adiabatic. The adiabatic always has a bigger slope than the isothermal. I'm telling you that for a reason. Oh, that's about the person eating food and all that. That's. Did we talk about the working of the heat engine? We did. Heat is absorbed, work is done, heat is rejected. Here is the actual heat engine. Welcome to my world. You see the two valves on top? This is the inlet valve. This is the outlet. Let me tell you that this is an old engine, picture of an old engine. Now we have what's called multiple fuel injection systems. Have you heard about that? So that's, that's where we use a carburetor in this case. So this valve is open. And air plus fuel is coming in. Watch carefully. You see this valve open? As the piston moves down, there's kind of a partial vacuum here, so it sucks in the air and fuel mixture. The flywheel rotates, right? Now, that's called the intake stroke. Intake, because it takes in that mixture. This is called the compression. Watch. When the piston starts going back, that valve closes. See this valve that was open is now closed. And so what's going to happen is that mixture of air and fuel is compressed. When something is compressed, what happens to the pressure? Increases. What happens to the volume? Decreases. So the pressure is really high. The temperature goes up. And at the end of compression, that's a compression stroke, Right when the piston reaches the top, the spark plug produces sparks. You see that? And don't you have gasoline in there with air? 
So as soon as the spark is produced, what's going to happen? It's combustion, right? Gasoline burns, and then the heat is taken in by the air, and the piston flies down. As the air expands, that's called a power stroke. That's where we get the power from. And then, you notice that this valve is open now? That's the exhaust valve, opens, and all the burnt gases are pushed out. That's the four-stroke engine for you. Did you get it? Did you understand the four strokes? I mean, just the basic ideas. Intake, compression, power, and exhaust. And why did I say every engine needs four of these cylinders? I mean, four, basically four cylinders. Because you need at least one of them going through the power stroke. So while the first cylinder is going through the intake, the second one is going through the compression stroke, the third through the power, and the fourth is at that time exhaust. And that rotates. So at any one time, you get a power stroke. Otherwise, your motion would be jerky. Imagine. It's only the power stroke that you go, hmm? Ooh, what's happening? Oh, it's just the engine. Do you want to be moving like that? Now, sometimes we use six cylinders. Some have eight cylinders. Now, if you have eight cylinders, then at any one time you have two cylinders going through the power stroke, which means you get more power. So where do you need those? You need those when you're trying to drive through sand. So if you go to the Middle East, all those sheikhs are driving eight-cylinder cars because it won't move otherwise. You know, like our cars, normally if they get stuck in mud, not theirs. Now, again, that's four-wheel drive. You know all that, two-wheel and all that. Come on, let's not even go there. But did you basically understand the idea of an engine? Do you want to change now to becoming an engineer? Hopefully. The COP in coefficient of performance of a refrigerator is given by TC by TH minus TC. You know what these stand for? Temperature of the cold and temperature of the hot. Now, this would be the temperature of the freezer. What's TH in an actual refrigerator? Come on. TH? Uh -huh. What is that? It's a temperature of something. I told you TC is the temperature of the freezer or the food inside the freezer. So what is TH? Where is the heat rejected to in a refrigerator? I mean a real refrigerator. To the outside? Correct. So it's the room temperature. So here's my next question. Can you actually cool a room by keeping the door of a refrigerator open? <laughs> that would be foolishness. Because now you're taking heat from the room, pushing it back into the room. What? <laughs> You need it to be enclosed so you can remove heat from that, you see, and push it into the room, okay. Now there is something called a heat pump. What's the heat pump? That's what we use in winter to keep our homes warm. You actually pump heat. How? You burn gas, uh, gas and then push the heat. Now COP of a heat pump, slightly different. Look at the formula, look at the difference. It's TH minus TC there. But did you notice that it's slightly different? You see the difference? So in the other formulas, you'll again have the same difference. I'm giving you another formula. COP of a refrigerator is QC by work. But for a heat pump, it's QH by work. So you have two formulas with that. Ding. Two formulas. So what's it talking about? The coefficient of performance of what? Of the heat pump? So be careful, use that correct formula. And do you remember that temperatures have to be in Kelvin? Okay. So 273 plus minus 25 which is 273 minus 25. 
and then you have 273 plus 40. So you have your temperatures here and you find the COP of a heat pump. HP there stands for heat pump. This is the formula, TH by TH minus TC. Did you get it before I did? It's straightforward. Now, why didn't we call it efficiency? Why did we have to give it a new name like coefficient of performance? What's the maximum efficiency possible of anything? 100%, so that would be one, right? One becomes 100%. Look at the COP here, how much is it? 4.82, so if this was a percentage, it would have been 482%, which is impossible, see? So the definition of this makes it the name coefficient. coefficient of performance. So normal refrigerators, today's refrigerators, have a COP of between six and seven refrigerators. And they try to keep on increasing it and like make it more and more efficient. So today we're standing at, oh, the first heat engine the steam engine had an efficiency of 15%. 85% of the heat was wasted. That's why a German scientist called Otto, O-T-T-O, he didn't like it, and he created the gasoline engine. It had an efficiency of 45%. From 15, I'm talking about the old ones, it went to 45. Another German, oh, Germans are beautiful automobile makers. You know that. And he didn't like that either. He said 45%, that's not enough. He created the diesel engine. His name is Diesel. His last name is Diesel. He created the new fuel. And the diesel engines are heavier than the gasoline engines. You know that. That's why trucks usually have diesel engines. And that had an efficiency of 55%. And then came the Wright brothers and the airplanes and the modified gasoline engines that hit efficiencies of 90% today. The cars that we drive are so much more efficient, okay? So that's the story, brief history of engines. Yes, ma'am, you have a question. What happens if you put diesel in a car? Which? What happens if you put diesel in a car? Oh, it won't work. Like it'll be too much. Because, the, oh, don't make me start talking, it'll be another 30 minutes, but I'll just, the diesel engine does not have a spark plug. So, so diesel, basically, let me condense it. Diesel is not mixed with air. They are not compressed together. Air alone is sucked in, and then you compress air. Now, what's the advantage of doing that? There's no chance of explosion. Because when you compress air and gasoline, if the temperature really goes up, Gasoline will burn, right? And then there will be an explosion. Your whole engine will be like a bomb. So to avoid that, what diesel did is he says, look, no diesel. I'm just going to compress air. Now there's no chance of explosion because it's only air. So you can get it to a high pressure and the temperature also goes to such a value that next you just spray diesel into it with a separate pump. The temperature is already above its ignition temperature. Are you getting what I'm saying? So as soon as diesel enters, it burns. You don't need a spark plug. So you need a separate diesel pump mm -hmm. and so on. It's a bigger engine and all that, so you can't. So these engines are totally different. So you saw in the gasoline engine, there were two valves. Now you need three in a diesel engine because diesel has to enter through a separate valve. So, so many, so many differences. No, you can't, please don't do that. Don't put diesel in a gasoline engine, it won't work. Neither the other way, it won't work. Thank you for that question. On a hot summer day, four million joules of heat transfers into a parked car take, takes place, increasing its temperature from 35 to 45 degrees Celsius. What's the increase in entropy of the car due to this heat transfer? Now for 
in change in entropy, there is only one formula. That is delta Q by T. So I'm going to write that. Change in entropy. So S is the symbol for entropy. So delta S means change in entropy. Change in entropy is the amount of heat entering divided by T average. Put this as average, AVG. You know the, how to take the average of two temperatures? Add them by add them up and divide by two. So in this case, in this problem, the temperature was 35 and then it became 45. So the average is 35 plus 45 by two, which is 40 degrees Celsius. But again, you cannot work it out in Celsius. You have to change it into Kelvin. So I took the average and changed it into Kelvin. So that's the average temperature. And then all you got to do is get the heat uh, transferred and divided by the average temperature, you have the answer. Done. That's how you find the change in entropy. All right, we just started. I'm going to explain that again. All right, how do you do this problem? What is the formula for change in entropy? I gave you just now. All right, so what does Q stand for? The heat that enters the system or leaves the system. In this case, it's entering because ice needs heat to melt. Do you know any formula that gives you the quantity of heat when anything melts? Yes, we do. Can you tell me that formula? We did it yesterday. Nobody knows. That's when you heat or cool something. But there's another formula that involves latent heat. You all remember this one? For phase changes, you use this. Ice melts, that's a phase change. So you need the mass of ice, which is given as one kilogram, and then you need the latent heat of ice. It's, it'll be given to you. It's 10 to the five. I used one kilogram, so calculations would be easy. So once you get that, find the average, uh, find, put it into that formula. What is T average in this case? <coughs> when anything changes, phase, does the temperature change? No. So ice is melting at zero degrees Celsius, and until all the ice is melted, the temperature doesn't change. So that's the average temperature. But you've got to have it in Kelvin, which will make it 273, and that's it. And then you're done. I'm setting it up in such a way that I can ask you uh, some questions on the exam. So joules, and that's 273 Kelvin. And when you put that, what do you get? B in divided by 273 gives you 14478.3 joule per Kelvin. So look at the unit of entropy. It's joule per Kelvin. That's how you do that. All right? All right, I apologize. That was a calculation mistake. So it's actually 12, 19.8, is it? Yes. Joule per Kelvin. Thank you.